Dr. Chris White joins me this week to discuss yeast viability, harvesting, and pitching yeast. This is Beersmith Podcast number 280. This is Beersmith Podcast number 280, and it's early May 2023. Dr. Chris White joins me this week to discuss yeast viability, harvesting, and pitching. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. Beersmith is the world's most popular brewing software to support your beer brewing with advanced features used by craft breweries worldwide. Available in both desktop and web-based format, you can build recipes from your computer, tablet, or phone. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com or give Beersmith Web a try by setting up an account at BeersmithRecipes.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Dr. Chris White. Chris is president of White Labs, Inc., a top provider of brewing yeast worldwide, as well as 2015 winner of the AHA Governing Committee Award for a Lifetime of Achievement in Brewing. He's also the author of the book Yeast, which is the ultimate reference for brewing yeast. Uh, Chris, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Thanks, Brad. It's uh, great to be back. Doing well. I'm thinking you from San Diego, California. And uh, it's nice over here and uh, happy to talk to your audience again. What are the uh, before we get into the into the details for today? What are some of the things happening at White Labs? Oh, it's always go go go! You know, uh, making all these different yeast cultures and bacterial cultures and uh, and things for home brewers and brewers around the world uh, it keeps you keeps you on your toes. Uh, we, we produce almost eighty different uh, yeast and bacteria strains here and in Asheville and, and also in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, and we got some great teams uh, working on it. So making a lot of different yeasts, uh, finalized, uh, you know, releasing all our yeast in our new uh, Pure Pitch Next Generation uh, package for home brewers. Uh, we uh, released our first strain in dry yeast, um, California ale yeast uh, for home brewers and pro sizes. And we continue to do things with our commercial brewery, White Labs Brewing Company, uh, to keep using these different strains and Clarity Firm and things like that to um, experiment and, and uh and uh, and taste different beers and different techniques. So we're just uh, commissioning uh, a new brewery in Asheville. Uh, we've been going five years there with a smaller brewery since we opened it, but uh, now it's going to have a nice big new uh, four vessel system. Nice, that's awesome. How's um uh you you were mentioned I think before the show that we might, you had done some work maybe with low uh, uh let's see low alcohol yeast I think. Yeah, you know, that's uh, every year, every time we talk, right? Not even every year. There's some new uh, new styles, new things people are interested in. Right now, uh, in craft beer, uh, non-alcohol is is surpassing a lot of people's uh, expectations on how well it's selling. And so, therefore, brewers are calling us asking uh, what types of yeast uh, to use. And so, we have uh, three different non-Saccharomyces uh, yeast uh, that we make for them. But, you know, there's also non yeast ways of doing it of removing alcohol and uh new techniques so this new generation of non-alcoholic beer is lower calorie um lower carb uh and and uh very little alcohol and young people are drinking them um seems to be like non-alcohol beer or spirits are really uh doing well right now with with consumers post-covid so uh, it's just been another uh, interesting way to explore. So I've been trying as many of these non-alcoholic beers. I used to be kind of like, ah, I don't like them, but I don't want to keep my head in the sand. I've uh, been trying a lot of them and, uh, you know, getting an appreciation for them. Yeah, I had uh, had a guest on, uh, I think, from one of your competitors a while back, but he had sent me a couple non-alcoholic beers made with the uh, just, just the, non-al- the low-alcoholic yeast. And uh, they were surprisingly good. I, you know, they really didn't taste like, you know, the old O'Doul's or some of the other stuff I'd had before, you know. 
Yeah, it's become something that you can have that's enjoyable. It's not just if you have an alcohol problem or something and there's these poor tasting things out there or, you know, you just don't want beer at all. You know, I mean, there's lots of reasons in the past, but they weren't very good. Uh, now you can enjoy uh, these non-alcoholic beers. And especially, I think, <clears throat> when I ask people what they think, uh, I like to ask the younger crowd like the 21 to 25 year olds is always what the brewing industry is coveting you know for for sales and uh and things so i did the same thing when hazy beers came out like i couldn't understand them so i asked young people what do you like about them and then you know they're describing the mouthfeel and the positives and i did the same thing with non-alcoholic beer and i think what's interesting is the descriptions i get back are not beer descriptions and maybe that was my fault always in not all beers looking for it to taste like beer but yeah. the sensory Things I get back from people are uh, uh, lemon or tea or, you know, these other descriptors we don't typically use in beer sensory evaluation. Uh, but maybe with the younger crowd, too, not drinking as much beer in their life, they're just turning 21 or something. There's more openness about some of these different flavors. Hmm. Uh, well, today you wanted to cover yeast viability, harvesting uh, and pitching, which are all important topics. Uh, let's start with viability. What? What do we mean when we talk about viable yeast? Viable yeast are yeasts that are alive. So you can have dead yeast and you can have uh, yeast that are alive. And there's been always people wanting to, you know, find more precise ways of really understanding the yeast physiology from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. But viability is fairly easy to measure with methylene blue or methylene violet. Uh, and um, this, these cells that stain darker are dead and for the most part. Uh, and so it's filled with some air, but it's also you know, fairly easy to do. And so it's still the mainstay laboratory test for brewer's yeast. Uh, and, you know, people used to say, well, it just tells you if it's live or dead. Yeah, methylene violet is, does a little bit better job uh, of that. But it also, if you have a lot of dead cells, there's probably a lot of other cells that aren't very healthy. So it does give you a, a sense of the yeast health as well. Interesting. Um, and so when we talk about viability, I mean, how long does an average yeast cell last? Uh, you know, I, I know, for example, liquid yeast uh, becomes less viable over time, right? Right. So uh, yeast are alive. And a lot goes into how you make them and what you, how you store them, you know, to determine how long they're going to live. Not everything can survive the same. Um, but we're also in the brewing industry. We're in a kind of unique place where we're making beer on barley malt, malted barley uh, that has a, some nutritional value and things too. Very different than fermenting water or wine or other things, right? So, uh, and, and that for that reason, brewers have always reused their yeast cultures. Uh, that's how it's been done. <clears throat> that's why we have the yeast strains we have from brewers reusing and reusing and selecting different yeasts in different breweries and different regions to adapt to certain beer styles. Uh, so that's why we have what we have. And uh, but. Typically, like even when I entered the business 28 years ago, officially for White Labs, but uh, over that, you know, over 30 years in home brewing and things, um, it was always thought that yeast are just alive for a few days. You know, you got to collect it from the fermenter and reuse it right away. Um, and there's some value, there's some truth to that. I mean, they do perform, when they come at the end of a beer fermentation, they're not very healthy. Uh, there's alcohol, there's stress. Uh, there's low oxygen given to the yeast. If we were in the biotechnology field or, you know, different kinds of baker's yeast production or all dried yeast production, really, uh, where they get a lot more oxygen, um, they can grow more cells and they're more healthy. But in brewing, we don't give them a lot of oxygen, just that little bit in the beginning. So they don't make as many new cells and, and they uh, typically have a viability if you collect it, a good slurry from your beer, uh, about 50% dead in 30 days. Wow. That's uh, that's pretty low, and obviously, I, when you when you package it, it's quite a bit longer, right? Yeah, because we're not collecting it from a, a beer, you know, like the beer we make at White Labs. That yeast 
is that yeast for the brewery. But when we make yeast, uh, most of the yeast we and most of the wort we make here is for yeast. Um, it's grown in a special way with the right what well, we use all malt wort <laughs> for most of it, um, and uh, well, all of it, you know, all malt wort, unless you're talking about some really specialty wild yeast strains, um, and all grain for the most part. So we can. Uh, give the yeast a lot of nutrition, but then also a lot of extra uh, phosphates and zinc. So zinc and oxygen are the main things. Uh, and that'll be the same thing in brewing to maintain uh, really high viability at the end of a propagation. Okay. But that means nothing if it's packaged in a way that then uh, uses that oxygen or introduces more oxygen, I mean, um, which we'll probably explain here. Okay. Um... Is there any way to estimate the viability for a given package of yeast? Let's say I buy uh, one of your packages off the shelf. So you could always estimate, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but just remember, it's an estimate. Yeah. <laughs> right? The, only, the way to really measure your viability is in a microscope with methylene blue, no matter what. It's still got some air to it, but because you're looking at a tiny sample, it's some cells don't stain right, things like that. But uh, it is the way to look at your yeast viability. Everything else is an estimate. Right. Um, and, you know, there's uh, on most of the uh, cal yeast calculators like yours and Mr. Multi and things like that, uh, there is a viability calculation part in these calculators, right. uh, mostly for making starters. The starters have been with the home brewing industry since before yeast producers. <laughs> and so uh, home brewers were always growing up yeast cultures. Um, and so those viability estimators are, are handy. But and uh, I know Jamil's, for example, because uh, Mr. Maltese, because I worked with him on the yeast book, you know, he did experiments and others have done that to create his viability calculator. Yeah. but it wasn't white labs yeast and certainly not our yeast of today, but not even our yeast from before. So everybody that produces yeast, whether you're doing it at home or a different company is going to make it up to a different physiology. Yeah. I think all the calculators use a, you know, some kind of estimate that a certain portion of the yeast dies off every month. But when I actually got some of the viability data for your lab, uh, it wasn't quite that simple, you know? <laughs> right. We have our own viability calculator that we've, never put out there but we probably should uh at some point uh if people want it but uh it's based on the last 10 years of data in all 80 different strains and i've got one that's just averages it all and then i've got it by strain you know but um uh and because we're doing viability numbers every day from pulled lots from right samples that are sent back to us from shipping between our three locations uh and it's our, I always check against that, that calculator. That's the averages of all. And it's really, really close to the samples we receive. Yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to see it. Certainly. Um, yeah. And it's quite a bit different. Like if you plug in white labs, uh, made on a certain date, maybe it's four weeks. It might tell you it's 40% dead or something. And that's, that's just, it, it'll, it'll give you a recommendation to make a large starter. So it's always going to work good. So it doesn't mean the calculators aren't working. It's cool, Yeah, but it's just, uh, we have a lot more viable yeast in the package. Than that. No, no, I agree. Um, the only, th only other thing I want to ask, ask you about viability is when, when is a boss, uh, you know, a, a packet of yeast really past its prime. I, I think you guys quote like a six month shelf life or something like that, right? Correct. Uh, seven months now with your pitch next generation. So, you could use it up to those dates, uh, and not many people do. You know, most people are using it within a few months, but it does give um, uh, ability to, you know, for, for stores to keep them or for people to keep them for long periods of time. I mean, even with earlier generation Y Labs yeast, years ago, people, we would get stories all the time for people who had them for a year or longer and then used them even without a starter, and they work. And people would be surprised. Well, you still have a lot of viable yeast, right? So even yeah. after, um, and so that's where the starter comes in nice. If somebody's going to make a starter, so you could take really old yeast, uh, and uh, you still still millions of cells, billions of cells per mil uh, right. at that point. So, um, you know, you you can make a starter and and 
recover any uh, white lab's yeast from the last few years. Uh, but most people want to buy yeast with as, as fresh as possible and use within you know the first few months. But uh, we've just kept working on uh, producing higher viable yeast this whole 28 years, really, right, right, uh, uh, to get to where we are today. Yeah, and then uh, we I think we discussed this before in a previous show, but your pure pitch stuff came right out of the pharmaceutical industry, right? The packaging. Right. The, the thing we did differently was collect yeast in a concentrated form uh, by using the film and heat sealing mm -hmm. uh, to, a, to a certain concentration, which is what our, our target is 2.15 billion cells per mil, which is a pretty thick slurry uh, across all of the strains. Normally, if you just collect yeast from your fermenter without some really active ways of getting it more concentrated, you're going to collect about a billion cells per mil. And that's what some other producers are at, too, of yeast, pro yeast producers, because that's pretty standard, 1 billion, but uh -huh. we can get it into 2.15 billion. So twice as much, yeah. Get a smaller volume. Wow. Um, well, many commercial brewers and a lot of home brewers also like to reuse their yeast. Uh, what's the basic process for harvesting yeast, uh, you know, on the homebrew scale? I know you guys use a, a fairly involved process, obviously, commercially, but. Yeah, it's funny when you talk about it, if somebody's never done it, I'll be 10 words in it. It can sound really complex, but it's actually pretty easy. And a lot of your audience, of course, is repitched yeast. Um, you know, you're, you want to collect it from the fermenter, the bottom. You, it, back in the days, older days, people used to collect it from the top, but we don't have too many open fermenters anymore, even though that's the best yeast because it's up on top within the first two to three days. And so you're not waiting to the end. However, most people aren't doing that anymore. So you're collecting it from the bottom after the fermentation. So you want to uh, remove the beer. There's a lot of fermenters now with a little uh, valve at the bottom to collect the yeast or a bulb that the yeast goes into. <coughs> Excuse me. So a lot yeah. of creative ways of collecting yeast today. That has been for 150 years, people have been working on ways to collect yeast, you know, uh, from the top and now from the bottom. Um, and so you want to, uh, ideally, again, you have the microscope, you look at what the cell count is of the slur of the, you know, homogenized slurry once you collect it. Um, but you're going to remove the yeast from your beer anyway. You know, if you think about it, you, you don't just drink your yeasty beer, you, even hazy beers, you know, you take off the yeast. Might as well reuse it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's what brewers have done forever and it's healthy. It's, uh, for the, you know, unless you're waiting a month or two, uh, it's, uh, it's ready to go. It's, it want, you know, the yeast that has been selected by brewers is the ones that would be pitch good. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's really good to, to reuse it. Uh, and you know, contamination things like if, if, if you're getting your slurry contaminated, you're getting your beer contaminated. If you're making good, clean beer, you know, collecting slurry, uh, and reusing it is, is pretty straightforward. So basically, I'd want to um, clean out my, uh, you know, have a sterile vessel or, 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 a, or a sanitized vessel to put it in. And then I should be able to just draw it off right off the fermenter, right? Right. So back in the days with the carboys, uh, still there are some people using them. Uh, you know, you just rack off the beer, stir the yeast into solution. Uh, and the more you do it, the better you get. You know, you try to get that creamy uh, layer. Uh, and pour it into a sterile container mm -hmm. or sanitized uh, container, cap it up, put it in the fridge. You want to capture the yeast pretty much as soon as the beer is uh, done fermenting. There's a big difference in what you're going to collect if you let it sit there for two weeks. The yeast is dying, right? So, right. Or versus the day after the beer is done. So that's why homebrewers back, you know, for a long time, always would ha uh, rack the beer to something else take the slurry and, and collect it. Now, if you're in a, a, a conical fermenter or you're something, you can kind of just collect the yeast off the bottom. That's fine. You don't necessarily have to rack it, but there's still some benefit to, for clarity and things to racking a beer. But, you know, a lot of commercial breweries don't do that. They're just in a cinder conical uh, fermenter and they collect the yeast and it sits there a bit longer and then they go over to a conditioning tank and then kegging. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um What's the term? I've heard about the term washing the yeast. What does wash, washing yeast refer to? So washing the yeast is kind of another old practice that I really don't feel is necessary anymore. Uh -huh. But we write about it. People 
still do it. And it's fine. You wash it in uh, sterile, if you can, water, uh, you know, uh, water that you could buy, you know, from the supermarket um, is excellent water. There's, there's some of the highest FDA standards uh, for drinking water. Uh, so you don't even have to sterilize your own or your own or anything. So you can use that water and you pour, you let the yeast settle out. You pour off uh, the top of it. You pour some water on, you mix it up, you let it settle again. You do that two or three times and you've washed out some of the true. You've removed the alcohol. Uh, but the downside is you've also removed some of the nutrients and you gave it a possible exposure of this handling and pouring that could uh, just give you another problem. And mm -hmm. you're introducing oxygen, which is going to degrade its uh, shelf life. So, uh, each, so each time you're maintaining the sediment or are you maintaining the, the pour off, I guess? The sediment. Yeah, yeah you're, that's you're, what I thought. You're getting the, the, the yeast cream. Uh, the nice thing about commercial breweries is the, uh, you know, when they're collecting it, as, as homebrewers can do, but it's a little bit smaller. Sorry, you know, you're collecting it and you pour off the first part or you just let it drain, right? It's a little darker. Then you get to the creamy yeast, that real center layer, and you collect that and then put it to drain again. So in home brewing, it's a little harder to do that. You know, we're only collecting a little bit of yeast. And so I'm sure there's some people out there who are also trying to, to get that magical, you know, center layer of yeast. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's your highest viable yeast. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you've collected it. How do you store it properly? Well, you want to store it uh, in home brewing. It's pretty easy to store in your refrigerator. Um, commercial brewing sometimes gets a little tricky. Uh, obviously, if they have a walk-in, easy. Put it in the walk-in. Uh, a lot of breweries, believe it or not, don't have walk-ins, especially outside of the United States. <clears throat> so they have to build uh, some kind of refrigerator systems, which they usually have for, for other things like hops and stuff. But a lot of beer around the world, surprising to a lot of American brewers is, is not stored cold uh, and cold rooms are very expensive electricity is very expensive in other parts of the world uh, but for yeast you want to store it cold you're trying to trick the yeast into this dormant phase right right so you've done a healthy fermentation hopefully you've supplemented your fermentation with zinc and that's really gonna help so many things in beer but including yeast viability and then uh, you collect the yeast quickly after fermentation, uh, after reaching terminal gravity, really ideally within one day of terminal gravity. And then you put it in your fermenter, uh, sorry, in your cold, in your refrigerator. And you might want to burp it the first day or two if there's CO2 in there. CO2 trapped in the yeast will degrade the viability as well because it's toxic to yeast. So um, you want to also minimize oxygen pickup. Mm -hmm. That's key, right? Because at the end of fermentation, yeast store, when there's just a little bit of maltose left, the yeast knows to not eat it all. <laughs> it's been programmed to store it. Right. We store that extra sugar as fat they, and, and, and glycogen, but they, store, they only store it as glycogen, which is just all these glucoses put together. <clears throat> but if you collect the yeast and you introduce any oxygen in there, the yeast is going to use that oxygen. Hey, break down that gly glycogen you just built up in the yeast by the end of fermentation. So it's really the, the more you can keep oxygen out of your yeast collection, the higher the viability is going to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I said pour it, you know, ideally you transfer it. Like, and that's why even collecting from the bottom is better. Uh, collecting it through a little parasaltic pump can work. Uh, any kind of aseptic transfer or... Um, that you can build into your system rather than pouring yeast, which is going to introduce oxygen. It's what most people do. Uh, and you know, if you use the yeast right away, I'm just saying that the more oxygen you keep out, the higher the viability is going to stay. And those are the two of the things we really focus on at White Labs, oxygen and uh, CO2 buildup. Right. Right. Is there any trick to do that inside the, the fridge? Cause obviously the temperature is going to drop as you go. And uh, I mean, should I use a, I don't know, a airlock on my, the top of my bottle or something? Airlock's good, but you still might have to stir it up to get that CO2 out, uh, you know, a little bit. Uh, you're not trying to introduce oxygen. You're not opening the top at that point. But, uh, you know, the, the gas has got to kind of stay in solution. And homebrew, in particular, compared to commercial breweries, those little fermenters and little openings tend to have a lot of saturated CO2 in there. If you ever kind of stirred up your fermenter and all this gas comes out, 
it's it's not supposed to really be like that. It's just the dynamics in our little fermenters uh, and at our temperatures we're fermenting at sometimes keeps it uh, too much CO two in, in solution. Hmm. And how long can it last if I if I store it properly in the fridge? Uh, how long can I uh, use it uh, and repitch it safely? So we, we'd like to say you know check the viability in a microscope, but Reality is uh, you're really not going to have many problems under two weeks. You want to reuse that yeast within two weeks, uh, it's pretty foolproof. You want to use it in three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, tons of people do. The viability is a little lower, but there's still a lot of yeast there. So, you know, if you might not be ready to brew again in a couple weeks. You might not want to use that particular yeast strain again in a couple of weeks. So there are people uh, out there that are holding on to their yeast for six months, eight months, 10 months, and then doing a little starter uh, and kind of trying to get the uh, cells to reproduce again. But in a starter, usually it's still just not really reproduction. It's just a little bit of metabolism creating some CO2. Hmm. Would the cell count uh, in a harvested yeast sample be similar to buying a packet of yeast or not? Well, a little bit, like, uh, like I say, most of the slurries just kind of done uh, manually get you about a billion cells per mil. Uh-huh. Uh, if you're collecting too much liquid, you know, it might be less than that. Um, but it's really hard to collect it much more concentrated than that unless you have some, some ways like, like we're doing. And the film really helps us. Uh, and not many people are using that. So, uh, you know, about a billion cells per mil will, will be about, uh, you know, will be over two billion cells per mil. Um, I hear people say like something like, oh, sometimes, oh, I've got 10 billion per mil. Uh, that's actually dry. So material. So uh, <laughs> that'd be dry you know, yeast, it, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, well, how much harvested yeast is needed for a five gallon, uh, you know, 19 liter homebrew batch? Um, not much, I guess, right? Not much. I mean, you know, for, um, I mean, I guess if you're talking, a, you were saying like a billion cells per milliliter. So I guess we need, uh, let's say it's 150 billion cells for a, for a typical homebrew, maybe. So you're talking about 150 milliliters of yeast, not much, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, under 200 milliliters, uh, basically, if you look at our volume, it's 70 mils at 2 billion. You could use 150 mils at 1 billion and have this kind of pitch rate we're uh, trying to shoot for of 7.5 million cells per mil. Right. You could use 200 uh, mils, uh, which is probably what a lot of people would do and, and use a little extra. You have all that yeast you're recycling. You don't want to use too much. It's important to have a good lag phase. Because yeast are taking in the nutrients from the wort, all the cells are getting the right amount of nutrients, and then they're going to start fermentation. You don't want that fermentation to start too quickly. They have a, uh, because of competition with too many cells, and then each cell gets less uh, nutrients. So you don't want to just chuck the whole thing in, you know, from yeah, what yeah. you just used. Some I don't want to take the take uh, the, the beer, leader leader of true at the bottom of the fermenter and dump it in there, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, it doesn't take a lot and it actually takes more patience on the brewer side to not to be too heavy handed. This will happen in some commercial breweries where it's so easy to use a whole bunch too. And you're making a half a bites in or something. And then, Hey, there's no banana esters left anymore here. It's because you've, you've over pitched and then they're not growing to making the, the right amount of growth rate to make the right amount of esters. Right. Uh, or it also gets some old yeast that tastes uh, yeast autolysis flavors. You want to, you know, get that culture to generate more cells. And I know that uh, the homebrew industry, we got pretty uh, good at talking about 150 billion or 100 billion or 200 billion and things like that. But uh, it's also real easy just to talk about millions of cells per mil. And that's what the whole world talks about with yeast, right? But our little home brewing community, even commercial brewing, it's millions of cells per mil. And so that's what we're trying to put on the package just because now you can translate that into anything. Any, you're doing 50 liters. You're doing, you know, uh, uh, 30 gallons. You're doing all these different sizes versus just a number that only applies to five gallons. So um, nothing wrong with it. It's just real specialized in the home brewing community. 
just talk about a number of cells. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what are some of the other considerations when we repitching your harvested yeast? Um, well, you want to have good aseptic practices, uh, of course. You know, and again, when you're home brewing, you're learning aseptic techniques. Uh, otherwise, you have strange tasting beer. You know, so that helps people learn some of the microbiology clean techniques. It's more than cleaning; it's microbiology clean uh, that you want to do. And, and uh, uh, the best brewers are, are great at that. Um, uh, you and you, um, uh, I you know, little things like dating, uh, putting a label on the yeast uh, collection uh, because. You might think you remember when it was, but, you know, put the day, the, the month, the day, the year. Don't forget the year. Uh, put the time, put the yeast strain, put the beer it came from. Um, and it just becomes a habit. I know it sounds like a little thing, but I know folks, a lot of people aren't doing that. And it, uh, it, it can, you know, now you put the second yeast in there and, oh, it has a different color jar or something like that. I, I think just labeling is uh, very effective. Yeah, yeah. I would think so. Now, can I extend my uh, my useful life by creating a starter again from uh, from my harvested yeast? Uh, you mentioned trying to use the harvested yeast in just a couple of weeks. Um, can I perhaps make it a little bit longer? Yeah, I mean, you can pour off that liquid, and you can add probably hopefully aseptically, uh, you know, through some tubing or something, uh, some fresh wort, and let that ferment uh, for. Um, you got to give it some time. I mean, I don't like the one day. I like two days for yeast to properly consume those carbohydrates uh, and try to get them to make some new cells. Uh, and you'll see, you'll see CO2, but remember, that's just a byproduct of the alcohol production. Uh, it doesn't mean anything more than that. It doesn't mean a whole bunch of new cells are coming or anything. It just means they're breaking it down. They're breaking that carbohydrate down to uh, uh, alcohol and CO2. So you say uh, uh, you say a two day is a two day pitch is better for a, for a starter than a one day, right? Right, because then they're also getting into consuming all those carbohydrates. They're starting to create that glycogen, which is helpful for their viability going into the fermenter. Makes sense, yeah. Um, well, how many times can I reuse my yeast at the homebrew level, for example? Well, commercial breweries tend to reuse their yeast five to ten times, um, but they may they may have so better sanitation processes that, but typically two or three times is enough for most home brewers because you want to use a different yeast strain and it's already been two months uh to produce those you're not brewing beer every day yeah um you're brewing in a kitchen or a garage or something and not really a good aseptic brewery although a lot of breweries are pretty tough on conditions too um so I mean, you could go 99 times, uh, 199 times. You know, it's it's kind of all about those skills of, of collection, reuse, keeping the viability high. Uh, but typically, like I say, commercially, 5 to 10, they've got all their money out of it. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know there's some there's some old time commercial brewers that that reuse it infinite times. Right. Basically. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody can do that. But it's uh, it's probably not the same same yeast uh, five years down the road, right? At that point, right? You know, it's like seeing your child grow up or something, and it's like, oh, they haven't changed. Well, you haven't seen the change happen in front of you, right? And uh, you could say that about a lot of different things. And it's the same way with the yeast culture. It's like I've used it for ten years; and it hasn't changed. It probably has. It probably but has. So yeah. you, probably has. So yeah. Customers. <laughs> Um, well, any other, uh, thoughts on, uh, reusing yeast, at least at the homebrew level? And, and actually, can you talk a little bit about for a minute about how it might be different at the commercial level? On uh, reusing the yeast? Yeah. Um, you know, it might be some similarities, uh, of like, uh, there are a lot of brewers and homebrewers who don't want anything to do with collecting yeast. I mean, they didn't get into brewing to <clears throat> do microbiology. <clears throat> right. And, you know, home brewing allows you, you know, you're, you're not spending hundreds of dollars on the yeast culture and stuff. So 
you know, you can do that if you want to. And a lot of people uh, uh, don't reuse it. Uh, and on the commercial level, it's a little harder because now you're in the hundreds of dollars or thousands and, uh, and you really want to get some more uses out of that. Um, uh, so it, it's, it, so by reusing it, you actually get very low yeast costs. Uh, so some people who just don't want to, you know, reuse yeast buy dry yeast. I think there's lots of reasons to use dry yeast. Like I say, we released California yeast in dry form, but just to not reuse yeast is not, I think one of them because now your yeast costs are actually much higher uh -huh. because you're doing buying it for every batch. And if you reuse yeast, you can get it down, you know, to dollars or cents per batch uh, versus still the 50 or $100 it costs to buy the dry yeast every time. So, or you can at least get it matching. Um, uh, and so I think there's different reasons to, 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 to do it or not want to do it. But uh, a lot of people also, <clears throat> maybe your listeners, <clears throat> sorry, today is a little low. Yeah, you're a little coughing. Uh, coughing. A little dry um, out there in Miramar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, there's, I think what happens, say in your home brewing or say commercial brewing, you start brewing and nobody really ever shows you or you don't do it. And then it just gets harder and harder to do it. It sounds so complicated. I, cause I get a lot of questions from people like, gosh, how should I reuse yeast? It sounds sure. really complicated. And I always thought that was a little odd before because I thought, gosh, it's kind of easy. You're brewing beer, you're transferring liquids. I mean, it's, you know, you don't need a lab to do it. Uh, you might need a lab to make yeast. Right. From small numbers of cells, but collecting large volumes of cells is pretty easy. It's what you do in brewing every day. Yeah, uh, they've been talking about you're, you're talking about pulling like 150 milliliters out of potentially several liters of stuff at the bottom of the fermenter, right? <laughs> yeah, beautiful yeast. Yeah. Uh, they've just budded in a you know non oxygenated uh, alcohol environment. They've really adapted well. You, people really uh, that do it often love the third generation. If the third generation isn't going good, it's probably because the yeast hasn't got it's been harvested too late or it's been overpitched, uh, things like that. Like that's third generation is kind of your sign for if you're doing it good or you're not really doing it best. It may look the same, but small details can be different. Your third generation should be your best generation. That means you're collecting the yeast at the right time after fermentation. You're not storing it too long. Uh, you're really keeping the gas out of solution. And, uh, and then the next generations are working great. Uh, if by third generation is not working, it mean you kind of beat that viability up the first time, the second time, the third time. And that's one thing that liquid yeast does really well is it repitches really well because it's grown in smaller batches. It has a, I mean, it just hasn't had the cell wall manipulated. It has a high viability. Ours, we have a good, good zinc. Uh, level and you know we're not introducing oxygen because there's no packaging line and we're not collecting it from a fermenter and we're releasing the co2 out of the film so all those things that i said that you want to do with your yeast cultures we've tried to integrate into our production and packaging so we can deliver yeast like that in the highest viability um and little things like that you can do on your own uh minimizing oxygen maximizing you know having the right zinc concentration uh, that's why I really like the cold zinc conditions with the yeast. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, interested. So, I mean, we've talked before about oxygen and how important it is, yeah. uh, especially in the early phases of fermentation, but we haven't really talked about zinc before. Can you just say a few words about um, why zinc's important and, and, and how you can possibly add it? And when's the appropriate time to add it? Well, I became really interested in zinc, uh, you know, 30 or so years ago, home brewing, and and going to breweries and starting to build my uh, yeast collection, uh, it was the old timers that would talk about zinc. So hmm. this is not some new thing. It's it's just it was like sprinkle this magic dust and ferment fermentations go better. <laughs> uh, and so we uh, uh, worked with Lala to make uh, Cervomyces a uh, long time. You know, I think it was two thousand one or something, uh, which was zinc encapsulated in. Uh, yeast. So you could build, build this huge zinc population within yeast and add it to the boil 
Hmm. And what that did was protect the zinc. Because right now, if you add mineral zinc, zinc kept the hydrate or something like that. If you add it to your whirlpool, if you add it to your boil, put by zinc. Really? It just, go, it, just it, it, uh, it sticks the protein. Right? And, and oh, you, so the, I guess the protein, protein from the wort just eats it up, huh? It's, it's in the true. So you must have to. Uh, so you must have to do a post fermentation, I guess. Then. No, you no. need it in contact with the yeast. It has to go inside the yeast cell to do its chemistry. Okay. So, um, and that's the tricky part. So you can use Cervomyces. We still sell it today, and that'll protect the the, the zinc. Uh, and that that gives you the right zinc concentration. Or if you want to use mineral zinc, because it is a lot less expensive and stuff, uh, uh, just make a sterile solution of it, you know, in water. Maybe a, if you've got a little uh, pressure cooker, and then add a little bit of that to with the yeast uh, into the ferment uh, when you're when you're going into your fermentation. Uh, we, so what uh, what form of zinc do you uh, use then? I I'm, you, go ahead. I'm sorry. What form of zinc well, would you add? Most people are using a zinc heptahydrate. Zinc heptahydrate, okay. It's just a bunch of zincs. Yeah. Uh, set together. So, uh, in why I, I, I'm bringing it up right now is people are still talking about it because it isn't new, but we get away from it sometimes. And uh, uh, Vinny uh, Salerzo, you know, uh, from Russian, Russian River, River Brewery, River. Uh, he just gave a talk to the California Craft Brewers Association at Sacramento a few weeks ago. Great talk. Him and Tom Nielsen, they gave a great talk on hops. Uh, and guess what? They're really good with hops. Uh, and uh, so dry hopping. And it was really about hop creep. Yeah. Hop creep's so, a real problem uh, for, for, for the IPAs these days. Absolutely. So they were doing uh, Pliny the Elder as a 28-day beer just to make sure they had ample fermentation time after dry hopping so that so the hop creep, which is a real thing, happened in the fermenter and not the bottle or yeah. the can. They've got that down to 16 days by a couple of things. One of those things was yeast health, improving their yeast health. And how do you improve your yeast health? Give it the zinc on the cold side. I'll be darned. <laughs> right? So we're still talking about We're still discovering it. Like in re little things, Rediscovering it. <laughs> rediscovering it. Um, and it also keeps, gives you a high higher viability over time. It's not affecting flavor. So, you know, uh, Dr. Michael Lewis taught at UC Davis forever. Um, I was talking to him about this in the early 2000s. Like, why adding Cervomyces is having this positive effect on fermentations? You know, I've probably maybe said this on the show before, but it, it, he said, but it's a mystery. Like, we should have enough zinc in the wort from the malt. So why is this happening? Well, it was really hard to measure zinc back then. Now we know we can measure zinc, and it's zero, even after you add mineral zinc and and the uh, and the kettle or the whirlpool because it just goes in the true. So that's what the mystery was. If you were adding it; it was just disappearing. That's really cool. Well, very interesting. Um, I did have yeah. one more question, Chris. I just uh, you you had mentioned you started doing dry yeast. How is dry yeast actually made? Uh, kind of an interesting question. It is made differently. Uh, same strain, that's important, but it, it's, it's uh, not uh, small batch processes and stuff like that. So uh, it's a larger batch, uh, and it, it's collected like we uh, collect our liquid yeast, but then you take it and you uh, dry it on fluid bed dryers because uh, fluid bed dryers really need uh, – you, you have to have a low temperature with yeast. Uh, you can't just lyophilize or you can't just do things you can do with bacteria. Yeast cells are very sensitive, so they require a very gentle drying. So we looked at different facilities to do it at, and we're making it in Austria uh, at a, a Lollamon plant that uh, is really, really good in between strains because it makes pharmaceuticals there, uh, and it's an old brewery. So, you know, I think we, and I went and made it. And, uh, and, and uh, we went back and packaged it. And I think, you know, there's lots of dryers out there that are kind of hard to switch between strains. And for us, it's super important as we're going to release more strains. We have WP066 uh, coming out soon, uh, right. our London Fog East. And, uh, 
you know, uh, it's really, really important to not have another strain in the package. Uh, and, you know, the level of QC we did was really extensive. So we think we made a really good batch of WP001 California at least. So you say you say dryer. I assume I assume it's not freeze dried or anything. It's it's probably just no, uh, yeah. air dried, right? So somehow. Yeah, you can't freeze dry uh, yeast, right? So air. Yeah. Interesting. So. Um, yeah, I, I've been looking forward to really having both forms of yeast because you know, and, and starting with our best strain, California ale yeast, because now you know brewers can decide what they want. I think uh, liquid yeast gives you. The best flavored beer, the yeast has never been altered. Uh, it imports and exports all the components correctly. It can be reused the most number of times. But dry yeast has such a convenience, you know, factor that if convenience uh, is is uh, more important to you, because getting it to you, shipping, all that kind of stuff, locations, uh, holding on to more packages. So there's a lot yeah, of I mean, I keep a couple packets in the fridge just in case. But, uh, you know, you never know when you might need some. But yeah, you can keep it for years. That's the other advantage, you know. Yeah. Well, Chris, uh, I want to get your closing thoughts on uh, on yeast viability, uh, yeast health, uh, and of course, uh, reusing yeast. Uh, yeah, yeast health. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Those are your buddies. They're making your beer. Uh, and uh, if if you, I mean, there is no happier place for a yeast to be than in a beer, right? They don't care about the alcohol like we do. Uh, it's part of the beer profile, right? But uh, that's why it goes outside the cell. But brewers, our forefathers, you know, the brewers way before us gave us these great yeast cultures by understanding yeast health, even when they didn't know about yeast. But everything they did to create a better crop uh, is the is resulted in the yeast we have today. So to honor that tradition, I think it's important to, to repitch. It's part of our... Uh, our heritage, part of our uh, skill set, um, just like cleaning. Some people had to learn a new way of cleaning or get out of beer making. <laughs> yeah. Just buy it. Uh, and I think this is just one of those things. And you know, and and having a thought process towards the health of the yeast you're collecting, so it's not just a mechanical thing. It it's not an engineering problem to solve. It's a biological thing, just like taking care of your pets or your significant others, whatever it is. Like there is things you do that make the yeast feel better uh, and live longer. And I hope we covered a few of those today. I mean, we could talk hours and hours and days and days yeah. to cover everything. Well, Chris, uh, uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. My guest today was Dr. Chris White, uh, president of White Labs and author of the book Yeast uh, from the Brewers Association. Thank you again, Chris. Thanks. A big thank you to Chris White for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. Beersmith is the world's most popular brewing software to support your beer brewing with advanced features used by craft breweries worldwide. Available in both desktop and web-based format, you can build recipes from your computer, tablet, or phone. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com or give Beersmith Web a try by setting up a free account at BeersmithRecipes.com. I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.